Checking back in with State Representative Tacky Chan of Quincy for another Tacky Talk. It's been a little while, Tacky. How you doing? I'm doing well, Joe. It's been a couple of weeks, so uh, happy to see you today on uh, today's Friday, right? Friday the 12th. That's right. Happy uh, Gong Hei for Choi to you. Hey, Sen Fa Go, Sen Lin Fa Lo, Gong Hei Fa Choi, Sen Ying Hong. Thank you, Joe. It's uh, this year is the year of the ox, and uh, for people who don't know, uh, the lunar calendar is the second oldest calendar in the world. So uh, a lot what's of... The first? What's the first? Uh, the Jewish calendar. Oh, okay, of course, yeah. And both of them actually use a lunar cycle. So New Year starts at sundown today. Uh, and, and it rotates around the cycles of the moon. And uh, several countries do practice lunar New Year still. China, Singapore, uh, Korea, Vietnam. So there'll be uh, different celebrations. And certain other uh, Asian countries celebrate the New Year's around the Buddhist holiday, the birth of the Buddha. So... On top of the Gregorian calendar, uh, they recognize uh, their own uh, cultural calendars as well. I'm guessing there's not going to be a big, huge celebration at the Chan residence for New Year's this year. <laughs> no, it's uh, me and mom in a Zoom call of family tonight. <laughs> Usually, this is where we still are. Uh, I, uh, this, I'm going to take a shot today and try to roast a duck and see what happens. Uh, oh, okay. Culinary challenges continue and I'm trying to <laughs> my life. So, you're, you're in good with the Quincy Fire Department, right, Tacky? Just, just in case. Yeah, the, the firefighters still like me so far. Okay. So, <laughs> if uh, anybody sees a bit of smoke coming off Black's Creek Marsh, that, that's probably me. <laughs> you better have a plan B just in case, or you're going to be hungry. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's always there's always Rouse pasta sauce. There you go. <laughs> Never really let you down. Just open a jar, and you're good to go. <laughs> Pretty much. That's my go-to uh, the pasta sauce brand. Uh, uh, it's the 33rd uh, annual uh, for Quincy Asian Resources uh, Lunar New Year celebration, and we're happy here at QATV to be helping them out with that, uh, a virtual celebration on uh, Sunday uh, the 14th, which is Valentine's Day, too. Yeah, no, I appreciate the assistance of that. It's actually kind of funny because when they scheduled this event at the high school, the North Quincy High School, uh, the challenge is working around between the basketball events, the volleyball events, and the uh, Valentine's Day dance. So unfortunately, as we all know, you know, we can't really get together in a normal manner and the scheduling for everything. We wish we had that problem with scheduling now, um, you know, working on other people's logistics. Right. But, you know, it'll be hopefully a fun event. I, I suspect I understand that a lot of entities are doing uh, events. For example, uh, Ted Boston with the Vietnamese community is doing their virtual event tonight. Um, and uh, there's a lot of challenges involved trying to create an interactive entertainment, trying to find people to provide content because of the nature of a lot of things that are done with, with the Chinese community involves um, uh, actual engagement of song and dance and people are familiar with the lion dance, which is a lot of close contact. And uh, these martial arts schools and other art programs are very challenged right now. Right. Yeah. Although I understand, uh, speaking of cooking, uh, your brother Rocky is going to be putting together some kind of a lobster dish. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Oh, it's stir -fried. he's probably doing sort of stir-fried ginger sky and lobster. Ah, okay. <laughs> a Chinese banquet knows all about this dish. <laughs> so that's something to look forward to. He might maybe he'll bring, bring you a little leftovers. <laughs> oh, maybe we'll get lucky. He'll drop some off that night. Uh, he's not getting in my duck, though. By the, time, by the time he gets here on Sunday, the duck will be gone. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I mean, it's a sign of hope, right? New beginnings, um, the characteristics of, of this particular uh, Zodiac are what uh, kind of put your head down, work hard, uh, you know, uh, re regroup, reset, if you will. Yeah, I actually, am, I'm actually born in the year of the ox. So oh. back to my year in the 12 year cycle, it's the second animal of the set. Uh, so ox years are, this year's ox years, according to some Zodiacs I've read, is, is a year of changing luck. Very vague term what that means. Okay. You know, it's a year to good, it's a good time to reconnect with friends and family. Um, it's going to be a hard time with relationship development. Um, you know, there's still love in the world, so to speak. We're looking for love advice. Ox is going to be kind of a mixed bag love year if you're looking for romance. Uh, regarding, you know, people's professional lives, you know, the recommendation is that you just got to keep your head down and try to get through this kind of year, which seems oddly appropriate. And expecting um, a strong financial market at some point. People are into finances. I expect people should be able to make money, but it's not going to come rapidly. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what the generalization of the, the Zodiac, I mean, you can get to the minutia, it goes into everything about what, you know, what kids are you going to have? I mean, if you want to go that deep into it, you're more than welcome to find it on a number of Zodiac websites to tell you about that level of detail. 
But those are kind of the general terms. And, you know, people, people, people born of the year of the ox, uh, you know, tend to be patient, tend to be fairly logical, and they tend to have uh, good uh, leadership skills overall. But they also have the flip side. They tend to be extremely stubborn, um, very, very stubborn. Uh, but they're also very steadfast at the same time. So like a lot of Zodiac things, it has like a, a two-edge type to it. So you can be very logical, but you also overthink things. You, know, you can be very patient, but it also means you can be very stubborn. Okay. And if you, can, you can also can lead, but it doesn't mean you always do well in following. So, so we'll, uh, we'll see what happens then. See what happens. I mean, you know, I portray at least the stubborn part of the uh, Zodiac. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't pursue that about you at all, Tanky. You seem to be pretty flexible. As long as, um, as, long as it's your way. <laughs> Exactly. It's always my way. I'm plenty of accommodating. Uh. <laughs> uh, let's talk about, because we can't ignore it because it's all the talk of the town, is the rollout of the vaccine here in Massachusetts and your kind of assessment of it right now. Well, it continues to be a confusing uh, rollout, isn't it? Uh, the governor announced this week this campaign issue uh, where you can bring a campaign that's not age 75 to also receive the vaccine at the same time with a person of 75. Challenge I think I was to discover is the website is horrible in the portal. And the people are able to figure out not using the state portal directly to vendors, uh, you know, pharmacies, hospitals, as well as the fact that the hospitals and various community health centers are contacting their patients. So while uh, the governor is well intentioned on increasing vaccination also to provide greater access for seniors to get to uh, the vaccination locations, there's some issues I think regarding the scheduling issue as well. You, you can't just show up with your 75-year-old mother to get a shot for yourself. You have to schedule it. But if, for example, in my instance, I took my mom to get her shot in the fourth at Tufts Medical Center. They called her. They didn't call me. There was no online portal, a component to, to uh, my mom taking her down there. And uh, it, was, it was very, very smooth. I mean, it was like a triple check system. They had a medical records up electronically. Very, you know, very detailed, very involved, plenty of, you know, doctors and nurses and everything else and very sanitary. I mean, great. But, you know, now the governor is suggesting that you can go get, uh, schedule your shot at the same time your loved one got the se is getting the second shot, which means the first shot for you, a second shot for that individual. Right. Which then now you have to schedule yourself a second shot without your loved one on a different day at the same location. And if you're not using a portal system on the website. This gets very confusing for me how this would operate. I understand the intention, but every time the administration puts out a new vaccine recommendation, it's causing confusion among everybody, including myself, exactly what message I'm trying to tell people on how this is implemented. And I, I do not need to um, expound on the level of disappointment from my constituency uh, telling me about how disappointed and angry they are, how things are worked out. I'm sure you're getting calls, emails, uh, texts, and everything else uh, from folks who are equally as confused. And yet, you know, like you said, the intent is pure. It's to get as many people vaccinated as possible, but uh, the implementation leaves something to be desired. That's correct. And I actually did some quick numbers this week. And, you know, we got about a million plus uh, doses in Massachusetts thus far. Uh, and, you know, people had asked me about phase one. Well, why do you finish phase one and foster phase two? But people don't realize that we never finished phase one. You know, the rough count of the governor's own numbers, you know, shows that they're well into, uh, let's see, uh, 200, well, 520,000 individuals in congregate care, front-facing, regular contact COVID, and healthcare workers that are uh, facing COVID but aren't front-facing, meaning they have a, uh, there's a greater chance of them getting it, but they're not there every day at the hospital exposed to patients. So you are in the possible zone of getting it because you're a healthcare professional but you're not in the ICU, so to speak, right? So, I mean, that's still 520,000 folks, which means that's over a million doses. Mm -hmm. We're already in phase two, and we have just got a million doses now, Pfizer and Moderna. That, that means we never finished phase one. Right. So people should know that the governor is moving forward in this plan on this date rollout based on doses, doses available that comes in, which has been very inconsistent. It's not like we're guaranteed 100,000 a week. It is some question mark. And I know the Biden administration, the biotech companies are, are generating more, manufacturing more of these vaccines. But, you know, he's going to 
push forward on his calendar as soon as he perceives a sufficient uh, vaccines in, in Massachusetts and then push out the next step of the phase, regardless of whether the phase is complete. Yeah. So, you know, people should not take too much stock in the fact that, oh, well, you know, I got missed on my phase. Well, no, you can still get your shot. Is everybody uh, above that level? So phase one's all eligible now and everybody in phase two is declared. And as we keep moving down phase two, everybody, you know, on the higher end of phase two continue to get their vaccine. Yeah, yeah. Just because you moved into another phase doesn't mean the last one stopped. That's actually correct. Yeah. And there's still a lot of logistical issues regarding congregate care. Uh, you know, now they're doing some senior housing. They're they're somewhere in the 40%-ish range mm -hmm. contacting get people out. As we know, the challenge is the fact that it's a short shelf life, special refrigeration, a uh, 30-minute-ish uh, time frame to get into your arm before it goes bad. And then you still have to do all the documentation identification. You got to make sure you got the patient. You got to take the date. You got to set that second appointment. I mean, second dose actually is much more complicated than people give it credit for. Mm -hmm. just a, mm -hmm. So you even get something that's, you know, once you're completely vaccinated, do you get some kind of a certificate that states that fact? Uh, my mom has not received one on the first shot. I'll tell you in, well, we're back on the 25th. So I'll tell you on the 26th. All right. Okay. <laughs> on the actual part. I think some, like some employers might start to require that or some airlines or, or colleges might start to require, I guess, some kind of proof. Yeah, they, I mean, there's some folks concerned that this is going to be a mandatory vaccination. Yeah. They learned that you cannot mandatory vaccine using a vaccine that has not been FDA formally approved. Okay. So this is an emergency authorization only. It's not a fully vetted FDA vaccine. Now, I'm not saying this is not safe. I'm also not saying you shouldn't get the vaccine. The way this rolled out was multi-stage. So normally, well, I was learning about how development works in this stuff, right? So... What happens is that you generally move in phases sequentially, meaning that it's back to back to back. The COVID-19 vaccine was done overlapping. So they're doing research and testing all simultaneously. So what happened was that, you know, we get through phase one and as soon as, you know, they're doing phase one, they're already into phase two simultaneously. So as opposed to doing like finish one, do the study, then go to two, do the study, they're all moving all these studies, all the development, all simultaneously. And there's a risk in this is that if you're not sure as soon as you finish your first set of R&D that this is going to work, you could have a problem moving closer to phase three if you were wrong at the very onset. Yep. Yep. So before you even started phase one, they had to have a high degree of confidence that they were already on the right track. And then once you get to phase you know, three, two, one, phase two started before phase one ended. Yes. Yep. And phase three started before phase two ended. So that allowed them to truncate the time on the clinical research by doing all the reports nearly simultaneously. Okay, yeah. Do you know, are they still uh, eventually, you know, proceeding to get full FDA approval? Well, they're going to have to at some point. The reality is the variant strands are coming up. This right. could be much like the flu. Uh, this is why, again, getting vaccinated is extremely important to achieve a herd immunity. And the herd immunity calculation right now is approximately 60 plus percent. And to get that number based on the infection rate. So the infection rate is 2.5 per people per one person affected. Uh, so if you're, you know, one person infected has that spread rate. That means they're, according to the immunologist math, there's about 60% plus the population needs to do that. And the reason is very simple. If the vaccine has no new host, it dies. Right. Yeah. So the theory is that if you don't get vaccinated, but there's 60% of people around you vaccinated, the odds uh, is greatly improved that you won't get infected, even though that you do not have a vaccination. However, if you are infected, uh, and, but you can't give to anybody that has been vaccinated. Okay. So All right. It's literally like, it's like, it's a, it's like bullying the virus into social isolation. You yep. just jam it into like a corner and it's got nowhere to go. And it's only choice is to kill its host or die, which it doesn't choose to kill its host because it, it's a virus. It just does what, you know, does what it does to replicate itself. So, um, to put in perspective, measles is the highest infection rate. It's 12 to 15 people, sometimes 18 if you're all trapped in a small room together. But, I mean, a 12 to 15 person spread rate, you think about it, that, that's insane. Mm -hmm. But you need, almost a, you need over 90% vaccination rate to create herd immunity in that instance because it's so contagious. Yeah. One person has a 15-time chance of giving it to you uh, compared to 2.5 that you have to have a 90% vaccination rate, which is why measles is nearly extinct 
in the United States and we're pretty much importing it from other countries when people visit from overseas that don't have vaccinations uh, or people who immigrate here with different healthcare systems don't have vaccinations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I testified at the Healthcare Equity Task Force, I believe it was Monday. The days are blurring, so I don't know what day I was testifying. Mm -hmm. I testified on Monday, I believe, that day talking about the fact that they need to do a better job rolling out vaccine as part of the larger program in the long term uh, about immigrant populations, especially people who do not come from our healthcare systems. People watching, in all likelihood, you've been vaccinated for measles. That that is already it was, happened. It was the uh, MMR vaccine. Uh, you know, it was measles, mumps, rubella that that was that was given, right? Yeah, all of them have an infection rate over five. Yeah, with measles being the bad one. So you know, people are like anti-vaccination. I'm I'm fairly confident you've already been vaccinated for those three things. Uh, and now we have chickenpox vaccination, which I had chickenpox as a child. You've had chickenpox as a child, but there's a whole generation of children who have never experienced chickenpox, and they should be very happy to have never had chickenpox. I remember that experience and would never forget it. Uh, but, I, but I, you know, I got it in like in seventh grade, I think. I was a late bloomer in chickenpox. So, um, so that's that, you know that's the changing where we live in. Um, but as the variants go up, and this is kind of the fear of everybody is that if it's not so much that it's more deadly in a conventional sense, it just spreads faster. Right. So the faster it spreads, the odds improve of people getting, the odds of people getting, the odds improve when they die because yep. of the increase, yep. increased infection rate. So we'll see what the studies come up. And uh, you guys probably saw the news that South Africa's variant seems to be more, uh, how do you put this, stronger. <laughs> more resistant to the, to the vaccine, yeah. Yeah, much more resilient. Yeah. And, but the UK one seems to be much uh, in line with the current strain we have. And we put in perspective, we already did have like up to three different mutations, even prior to the new strains, is that these new strains have a higher infection rate than the previous mutation. So Massachusetts is believed to have, and New York's believed to have this variation that came out of Italy. So it originates in China, and it already mutated within you know, a three-month period, mm -hmm. not even a three-month period from China to Italy, it already had a mutation before it came here. It didn't change the uh, ability for the vaccine to address it. A mutation does not mean it's a totally different critter, right. but it's still uh, sufficient to be concerned because it's you know, constantly evolving. Yeah, viruses are just extremely efficient living organisms at perpetuating themselves. That's all they have to do. Pretty much. It's, it's a very curious thing about viruses because no one's sure if they're truly dead or alive. They only come to life when they infect you. And it's dear to its sole job is to replicate itself. That is the only purpose of a virus. And viruses have been around since life has been around. Mm -hmm. So this is not a, I mean, it's not a new thing. It's just that we've gotten so much better at science and identification, and more so than any other time period that we, that we figured this out. You know, even hundreds of years ago, as people figured out immunization, you know, by um, exposing themselves to dead, dead viruses, which is basically an infection. So whether they consume um, old infections that are dormant, you know, to have your body basically learn to uh, fight the infection mm -hmm. is a type of immunization. So immunization has been around a long time, but people have this image of that type of immunization where you literally have to consume an old infection. Literally what it says, it's disgusting when you think about it, but it yeah, is. It's true. Yeah. Um, this is people before we had microscopes, right? I mean, this is back a long time known as done in, in uh, not necessarily, you know, people with this image as European medicine. I mean, people in Africa, you know, people in Asia before modern medicine, you know, were able to figure this out. Uh, and they created own immunization through that, that type of process. The, what's amazing here is that we're using MRA, uh, mRNA sequencing. So unlike actually have to go, actually have to grow the virus itself, disassemble the virus so it's dead and then introduced to your body, so your body is a blueprint of what to do. We're now making this RNA in the lab. It's actually not the virus itself. And you're just using that little bit of genetic code that you know that the, your body is looking for when the virus shows up. Mm -hmm. So, for example, it's like giving a picture, kind of similar, once like giving like a wanted picture to your body saying, hey, if this picture shows up, kill it. Mm -hmm. Right. There's no other instruction here. This is the thing you got to kill. This is what it looks like. Make your antibody, your, your white blood cells, your T cells, all their relative uh, defense cells to go kill it. And this is what you're looking for. Again, the question is how long does the body remember that? Right. So if it reappears, and the concern about mutation, that isn't a major concern yet, but if this physical cell changes enough, 
the, the spike protein because you always see this picture of this like spiky ball. You know, that those little uh, spikes is what connects to your cells. Mm -hmm. and it has a very specific node, like a fingerprint. It's like coded. So if it look, finds that, go get it. Just because it's mutated doesn't mean that spike cells changed mm -hmm. enough. The body doesn't know to kill it. It may have been mutated differently. Right. But if, if sufficient changed, then, then obviously we have a problem if vaccines need to be updated. But we can move quicker because this technology, mRNA uh, technology is so new uh, and it's so targeted and it's such a very specific part of a small part of a genetic code. It's not giving the whole genetic code. It's a very small part of it. That it's, it's much safer in many ways. People are very concerned about getting a dead virus, which also can't hurt you. Um, and you don't have to grow these viruses. Yeah, it's so pretty that, exciting when you think about the possibilities of, you know, the future of medicine uh, with this type of technology. What else, you know, could it be used for? Well, they're using uh, this technology specific for targeting things like cancer, mm -hmm. you know, HIV, um, you know, obviously various types of rare diseases, genetic issues. Genetic diseases are passed on generations. So, for example, congenital heart disease can be a genetic disease. Right. So, you know, people that have uh, a whole family of, of men, actually, who have congenital heart failure, uh, but it's all on the male side, all of the same surname. It's just the nature of, of that particular disease. Yeah, yeah. So other countries that even move quickly, like China, you know, did the old-fashioned method, like they do with the old flu vaccine. They manufactured a lot of the virus in lab and then took it apart and killed it and then created the uh, RNA from the dead virus itself and then introduced that as the vaccine. Mm -hmm. But again, we don't have like all the studies from there. We don't have all the studies from Russia. Um, you know, in our studies in the Western world in terms of uh, Europe and the Americas, will continue to be heavily peer reviewed. So people should be aware that science hasn't stopped. Uh, even though the vaccine has been rolled out, the science is continuing to study you know, on its e efficacy rate as well as potential change the vaccine, if needed, the variants start to get problematic. Right. Yeah. If they're, it's becoming ineffective, then something has to be done, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Let's uh, switch gears a little bit, Jackie. Anything happen on Beacon Hill this week we should know about? Well, uh, Speaker Mariano named his leadership team. Uh, so uh, you saw probably through the Boston Globe that he uh, introduced uh, the immediate core members of the House leadership team. So for the first time, we actually have a, a speaker, I'm uh, sorry, a woman as the majority leader, uh, Claire Cronin from Brockton. And then the new uh, speaker of time is Kate Hogan, which uh, location I just slipped my mind on. <laughs> Hudson, I think. I just lost it in my head. <laughs> um, but then we have the, uh, some of the old members of the team still in place. For example, Joe Wagner from Chicopee is still there. Uh, Sarah Peake has moved up from floor division leader to second leader. Uh, in that position, Mike Moran has shifted from second leader to assistant leader. Uh, Mike Moran from Boston, Sarah Peace from Provincetown. And then he wrote out his uh, floor leadership team that includes Frank Moran, who's Dominican uh, from uh, Lawrence, I think. I'm trying to remember. It's, he, he has Lawrence and Andover as part of his district. And um, uh, Tom Golden from Lowell, as well as this four of them. Of course, now I'm, now I'm blanking on the other two. Uh, <laughs> just this would happen, uh, okay. but I mean, it'll come to but, it'll come to me. But the uh, the reality is that uh, you know the uh, top positions you know, has more more people that are women, has uh, at least one person of color, and we have two people that are LGBTQ. Uh, Sarah Peake and uh, Claire Cronin are you know represents that. I'm sorry, not Claire Cronin, Kate Hogan and Sarah Peake. That's what the news articles because I didn't I didn't know about Kate Hogan. I don't get into people's business unless they tell me about it. But I did I didn't know that, and I it's like whatever as far as I'm concerned. But uh, yeah, she has two people from you know representing LGBTQ. So this is uh, you know very dynamic and very major change in leadership in terms of the total gen uh, gender makeup, uh, representing uh, all parts of the state from the Cape to Lowell, mm -hmm. uh, and also to Chicopee. So you got this geographic group. It is a broad age group of, uh, I don't need to keep repeating Ron saying he's old, but I mean, it's a, you know, bracket from people in their fifties to people in their seventies. Um, and, uh, you know, we have at least one person of color and the challenge of people of color in the state house. And I think the audience would hopefully appreciate is the lack of security. Mm -hmm. So the way it's now uh, because of just time, myself, Donald Wong and Russell Holmes 
and Paul Schmidt are the most senior persons of color. And I, in the Democratic caucus, no matter uh, what position I have, I am the most senior person of color. Hmm. Uh, it's going to uh, hopefully, we'll find out at 2 o'clock today, folks. Today at 2 o'clock, we'll find out uh, what our assignments are. Hopefully, I'll uh, keep a, a leadership position. But then Frank Moran is the class after me. And then I have uh, my friend Carlos Gonzalez and Ronnie Mom uh, and China Tyler in that class and Bud Williams. And then the class after that has, um, you know, Vargas and uh, uh, who else is that class? Uh, I think that's Nika Robinson win uh, class, uh, Miranda class, and they have new class after that. So why is seniority important? Well, seniority is how we know you can actually do your job because you, this is a job that you kind of do on the fly. And uh, if the speaker has confidence in people, their ability to um, do their job, Seniority is how you get there because there's no other way to know. Right. Yeah. So obviously there's winners and losers in any speaker battle. Um, there are more winners and losers because Ron uh, is the consensus candidate. So people have noted that Pat Haddad is no longer in the top leadership structure, nor is Paul Donato. So as we kind of internally roll out the leadership team, the rest of the leadership team in terms of chairs today, for people who are speculating about who are the winners and losers uh, in politics, you will now have a more definitive understanding of who's winners and losers and know where all the pieces fit. So it is like a March Madness a little bit in terms of brackets, uh, but it's very much of an internal issue in terms of uh, the ins and outs of the business. Yeah, and of course, this is all being done virtually, right? So that just adds another layer to it. Yeah, so the process is that we'll get a list from a speaker regarding his recommendations for assignments. The caucus will vote on that assignment as a slate. So you get a slate, and which is the, basically a big list of names, and then you vote on the whole list. Okay. If anybody has an issue, they can raise an objection during the caucus and try to get the caucus to change the assignment listing. Uh, not likely to happen. Uh, that implies that you are able to figure out where everything's got to move to and then proceed to gather enough caucus members to form an objection. Okay. Practically speaking, it's not going to happen. Um, and of course, people have met with the speaker regarding their request for assignments. Um, sometimes people speak on others' behalf, depending on the circumstances. So, and there's also recommendations uh, from other people that the speaker takes advice from that have observations of the membership. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't see every single person. I mean, that's unreasonable. So you do rely on other people that you trust to talk to them, to get their opinion about somebody that you may want to consider putting in leadership. Yeah, system. I understand. Okay. It's kind of like getting a reference. It's essentially, yes. Uh, it, but the reference is more of a, this is the problem of COVID now because it's such an in-person business. You got to be able to have people that have interact. For example, I have a committee. I interact with my committee members. Through our work, it gives me some thoughts and opinions about how they do their jobs. Mm -hmm. I'm not their supervisor by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they are a peer, and I got to work with them that way, but also work as a chair to bring them up to speed, to help them understand what's going on, and provide assistance as they need for whatever issue that may come up. Whatever the issue is, I'll, I'll try to help you. For the process, it has, it has to be done through a process, right? Yeah. It's absolutely correct. Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes you new to the state house, which I had three new members, uh, uh, people who just elected, and they had needed some assistance on this and that, and more than happy to, to provide that assistance. Um, but now, I mean, the new freshman class doesn't have um, us physically there to, to provide a hands-on experience, right. nor my staff to interact with their staff. Yeah. So this is kind of a very difficult situation to be in in terms of spending time in uh, other folks. So, you know, speaker takes in consideration all those things. He'll talk to other people, what, what people think of various folks and, and look at, you know, his own agenda um, as well as the various chairs remaining work from the previous cycle uh, to stop, stop putting that team together. And the team would change again every two years. And who knows? I mean, we've unfortunately, I've been around long enough. It's strange I've been around this long, uh, long enough to watch, you know, people leave midstream. Sadly, people pass away midstream. Yeah. Um, yeah, life happens. You don't know exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, two terms ago, I had four people in uh, in the session die, which is a record number. Mm. I think about 160 folks. 
of which um, uh, two of them uh, I w was elected with, which which just made it extra sad. Yeah. So um, so yeah, I mean it's like any other workplace. Uh, life happens and death happens. Right. Exactly. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping at some point we're going to um, get back in the building if we reach sufficient vaccination. But I'm still not optimistic it's going to be very, very soon. And I'm already starting to make plans, no matter what chair I'm in, of how to handle virtual hearings, how we're going to handle documentation on the cloud, how we're going to receive testimony, how we're going to be able to uh, do draft reviews. Uh, we got a little bit of practice in the fall. We still ran, I think, another six hearings virtually in the fall. Uh, in, in, uh, during COVID, during the height of COVID in the summer, we were kind of paralyzed because we weren't sure what was going on and you know, how we we're going to operate and technology wasn't quite up to speed. Um, so once we got our feet a little bit more sturdy during the late summer into the fall, we were able to hold some virtual hearings. Since we got a little bit of practice on that, we now have a better idea how to handle this. And then uh, we'll see what committee I get. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping to keep my committee, but we shall see. Um, and then, you know, but I, I already have kind of a, like an idea of how to do this implementation. Um, and as we're sitting here, I mean, imagine trying to sit here at a public hearing as a chair for like five hours. Mm -hmm. um, that is not advertising. So this, this, we got to figure out how to do this where uh, people do not have to be stuck waiting in the queue to testify forever, you know, because someone in front of you just won't stop. Yes. Yeah. And this is kind of part of logistics we're trying to figure out. Um, and we also got to count. For, we already had to We already had a public hearing. We had technology problems when the testifier. We had to like wait up for twenty minutes as my staff's calling the individual, trying to figure out what's wrong here, to make sure that person has the chance to say their uh, say their testi testify. We already had to encounter once. Thankfully, it was very small groups we were working with. But once we opened up to hundreds of bills, uh, you know, I need to work with my Senate co-chair on how to figure out. Yeah, uh, do this orderly and try to make it as painless as possible. With testifiers and for testifiers to hold testifiers accountable on being mindful of the time because there's other people needing to testify. Right. Yeah, it can it can really bog the process down really quickly. I can see how that could happen. Yeah. Yeah, and I can't look over my glasses from the rostrum down to you to tell you your time is up. I cannot yeah. do the whole, you know, hand signals staring at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, breathing heavily on you. <laughs> yeah, I can't breathe into the mic heavily. I mean, That's right. um, I, if people actually want me watch me run a hearing, I run a very, fairly orderly hearing, and I make it very clear to folks that I will, I will move you along if you start to uh, repeat and, and just be respectful of the fact that other people need to testify. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, all the, this is the nature of virtual. I don't have all these uh, mechanisms, in person mechanisms to kind of clue you in, like, come on, you know. Um, people we, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they can ignore the buzzer. My only choice is to cut the mic off virtually, which actually right. is problematic because to cut off the mic on this format, it, it's it's much more troublesome because you can't say, okay, can you wrap it up? You got no, give you another thirty seconds. You know, that's the other option. I don't I don't think that's going to work well. Um, and people who don't are going to be able to log in by telephone without actually having video. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's no visual. So I think uh, people that have done enough Zoom calls at this point uh, know that you can telephone in from anywhere. Mm -hmm. But I can't do hand signals. I can't mm -hmm. do eye signals. I can't do anything on the video if, I, if you can't see me. Right. Yeah, you can send them a message through the chat system. That's about it. Yeah. Well, you can dial in. You don't even need you – know, there's no chat system. Oh, just on the phone, you mean. Yeah, right. Yep. Yeah. So there's that a whole other logistics. I hope people watching this kind of appreciate, you know, through their experience on video um, – video-based work or, or family. Yeah. You know, now imagine trying to run a hearing where you, people have a right to publicly yeah. testify before a chair. Well, that's why I know some teachers are, are mandating that their students, if they're learning remotely, have to have the camera on so they can see them. Yeah, we, we can't do that to people. Right. right. <laughs> you know, we, we have to be, uh, no, we can't do that to people. As much as I wish I could, I can't do that. <laughs> so it makes it all that more important that, uh, you know, this, this vaccine rollout process uh, becomes a little more streamlined <laughs> and, and expedited. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, you're absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Because this is actually impacting the function of the public to be able to weigh in uh, on important issues before the committee. 
And this, I'm very mindful of that, that everybody should have a right to weigh it. And, you know, we're going to obviously encourage email uh, and letters. Mm -hmm. uh, email letters is what's going to happen. You send your PDFs in. Um, and we're also discussing how to change my mailbox around because my mailbox, my personal, uh, my personal, my personal business email box, meaning the business, the state of email box, is also the testimony email box. So you can imagine the bulk emails I get as we, you know, get into committee assignments. Um, uh, it just gets insane. I mean, you, you know, when you get close to a public hearing, I'll see 400 emails pop up. Right. Yep. So we're now having conversations on how to manage that because I'm trying to find your constituent issue regarding whether it be the RMV, nowadays vaccine, you know, unemployment, which is I'm getting a, still a lot of calls on unemployment still. I got to sift through all my email to find your email. Yeah. Wait for the testifier's emails and move all the testifier email to another yeah. email folder, hoping they'll not lose them in the midst of thousands. Yeah, that's why if you send anything, a good a good rule of thumb is uh, you know keep a record of it yourself, just in case it does get misplaced. Oh, absolutely. I mean, people who talk to me need to be very much aware of that. It's, you know, that's why I keep re, re, re emphasizing the telephone option. Mm -hmm. You know, please call and leave a message of anyone on the system now. Just pick a person. Yeah, you're talking to chance and just pick any staff person. Just yeah. hit a number. You mentioned you, unemployment, um, Taki. I was talking to um, Ron Yakabuchi earlier this week from the uh, Mass Hire Career Center here in Quincy, and he's a little frustrated because uh, his employees don't have uh, full access to information that he thinks would help them help people through the unemployment system. Um, is there anything that can be happening at the state level to to kind of recertify those those workers? Well, we um, had a talk with Secretary Acosta, uh, Acosta the, uh, last Thursday. Yeah, last week was supposed to be a week off, and still was some calls with Secretary. Anyways, besides the point, there's no such thing as vacations for me. <laughs> um, unemployment office is overwhelmed. They, they are very well DOA is overwhelmed. They have an enormous situation. They have over 50 employees at DOA taking intake. They're at 988 people employed. Wow. Of which 600 plus work set you know on a rotating shift seven days a week so they're operating on a seven day a week schedule of which of the 900 plus two-thirds are operating at any time because you know five-day work week yep people who do seven day schedules know what i'm talking about yep yep so they they are still trying to increase hires uh on that and train them and whatnot and there have been problems the legislature was not a shy during our conference call regarding all the problems we've encountered, ranging from poor customer service to inability to get good information for consumers to just bad information. And we did convey a lot of information to the secretary about direct contact with our constituents about what was going on. And she uh, took responsibility for that. The secretary you know, fully takes responsibility for that and uh, is investigating a lot of our consumer complaints, essentially. But we also very understand to know that we go from 50 to literally 1,000 folks working for you in an unprecedented period. Mm -hmm. There are going to be some complications. Yeah. And the legislature will definitely fund more staff if that's what they want. And they're still doing an evaluation about what they need still moving forward from us in terms of funding and anything else to, to make this operate. To put in perspective, I, I'm trying to remember my numbers, but I believe it's $22 billion in benefits have been put out already. Billion with a B. Yeah, to give you an idea of how much salary and how much jobs were lost. Yeah. Okay. So, hmm. and then uh, about 68% of all claims have been verified and approved. Because not every claim going in meets this requirement. Well, I tell people. Tremendous fraud, too, as, as you're well aware, yeah. Which adds to another layer of work that the DUA has to do mm -hmm. on identification, which is also frustrating a lot of people. Yep. And I understand the frustration, but the fraud levels cost us hundreds of millions of dollars. Yes. Hundreds of millions of dollars, and they still don't know how much is gone. And I actually have received word from some other constituents getting letters claiming that they got benefit they never got. Yeah. Which means now they have to dedicate people to clean that whole mess up because yes. of fraud. So they're battling like a whole bunch of things simultaneously and not to be more doom and gloom because everyone knows I'm doom and gloom. But this time between January and April is the make or break period for a lot of businesses. You know, PPP ended, 
people saw the spike in unemployment rate. And the, the winter months, you know, between Christmas, President's Day, Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, and we're a tourist area of March Madness and so forth. And, you know, around the country, you have spring break and all that activity between the months of January and into, into April, you know, before the summer economy hits, mm-hmm. you know, will determine a lot of how business are going to be able to get through this time period. Yes, yeah. And I think the Biden administration is well aware of that, and, and, and that's why they're pushing for um, this new relief package. Yeah, but even then, there's only so much you can do with, with that relief package. It's not a catch every look and cranny of, of, this, of every industry. The hotel industry in particular, for example, has not gotten a high level of attention it really needs mm-hmm. because of the nature of how hotels work, right? Um, and there's a lot of small franchise hotels that are owned by families. They're not all the Hilton, for example, where it's owned by one monster company. I mean, there's a lot of franchisees. And you know, for people who don't know, franchisees are small businesses. Mm-hmm. They put up their own money. They're mm-hmm. responsible for the entire business. They have to pay the, the, the brand name they're using for and to follow you rules and revenue sharing back to the brand name they're using for. For every McDonald's, Burger King, uh, uh, Howard Johnson, you know, down the street from where I am, yeah. those are franchises. And those are small business owners. Oh yeah, even some you know Dunkin' Donuts or other other chain restaurants that you think you know are are all set because they're huge. No, they're they're mom and pops. Mom and pops. You want you want huge? That's called Starbucks. Starbucks mm-hmm. is not franchised. Right. That is a behemoth corporation. But you're not helping small business through that because they're not a small business. Dunkin' Donuts. You're right. It's a franchise, even though they're a mega corporation. They're they're, they're the reality is that Starbucks owner at that shop lives or dies. If you show up, Starbucks, on the other hand, has that corporate behemoth. Yep. So if one store is doing poorly, you have you draw from another store. That that Dunkin' Donuts has no ability to draw money from another store unless they own more than one. Right. And even Beacon Hill, I've been told by my friends, is still going up and down the hill. You know, Dunkin' Donuts top of Beacon Hill is closed. How often we've never seen a Dunkin' Donuts close. I mean, unless the person retires or they relocate, you don't right. see Dunkin' Donuts closing. Right. So these small franchise businesses, you know, either have to downsize or, or pass on. And unfortunately, you know, the financial district in Boston is nobody's there. So those coffee shops, whether it be franchise or non-franchise is, is hurting uh, yep. food trucks. They're hurting. That's another one. Yeah, sure. So all kinds of cottage industries around hospitality as, as you know, so, and, and they're all going to be impacted. Yeah. Well, all the liquor stores immediately around the financial district are, are both dead. I know that Wallace and liquors and liquor stores locally are doing very well. But if you're in the financial district or you're near BC, you're not doing well Mm -hmm. because your customer base is there. Right. So there are winners and losers despite the fact that, you know, look, I say I have to, hopefully I'll retain my chair again. I don't want to get into it till o'clock, but, you know, I got to go back and talk to the hospitality industry again. And just because you see what's going on in your part of the world where you live in the state doesn't reflect the whole state's industry. And I spent a lot of time uh, this past uh, late summer and fall with various hospitality industries to try to figure out what's going on on a, on a statewide level with sampling from different parts of the state. So, for example, my colleague Mindy Dom's on the committee. She's the new rep from Amherst. Amherst is dead. The, the, the whole UMass economy drives that downtown. Amherst, people who went to UMass or been down and know what I'm talking My brother went to UMass Amherst. The, the downtown change very little, but it's been wiped out. And, you know, places like Holyoke, we use liquor license uh, returns to town to give us some sense of what the economy is going, even though not every restaurant uh, or food services has a a liquor license. Mm -hmm. We use that general barometer about how things are going. Yes. Yeah. Holyoke, I believe that 70% liquor license returns to the town. That's incredible. Uh, Boston, I'm projecting Boston will have 25% returns. Yeah. Uh, and maybe maybe 30%. I, I, we'll, we'll start digging to the numbers when we get to like April because we have, because there's, there's a time frame between uh, when it's returned and when it's reported. So mm-hmm. once I get to April, you know, we want to talk about this in April. I think once I get to April, I'm starting to have the staff yanking sample numbers from around the state. It'll be interesting to see that. Yeah. Because I know, at least here in Quincy, I know it, that has not occurred. It's, it's been pretty stable. Yeah, absolutely correct. So what you see here in Quincy isn't reflective of the whole 
situation state. Right. Yep. You know, uh, like I said, I don't. We can talk next week about my chairmanship, but you know, right now, you know, I'm, I'm still focused on the fact that uh, I need to get a new sampling from around the state to give me a, a sense of the statewide picture of what's happening. And when I talk to my colleagues as well, you know, again, they're only working off the sample of their own community. Mm -hmm. With the chair, you don't have that option. You actually have to sample the state and not think about just your home. You have a bigger responsibility. And the members of my committee will have a bigger responsibility than just your own district. Yeah. So, and, you know, data, because of how data is reported, is always, a, you know, it's not instantaneous. So we're always going to be a little bit behind. Uh, but we need to get, you know, we got to start talking about, um, well, we already are talking about how we're going to do that and, you know, convene some more meetings. Um, uh, with hospitality industry folks about where things are going. Yeah, so, it's going to be a it's going to be a year of uh, of change for sure, and uh, and and figuring out where we are and where where we're going. Well, I'm, I'm hoping again. You know, I repeat. I mean, only people that can uh, keep our economy moving is us doing our best to keep ourselves healthy. Mm -hmm. I have another friend whose roommate uh, got COVID. He's been in quarantine. He's losing his mind. Thankfully, he's not had any symptoms. He's very young, very healthy, could be a carrier, um, but you don't know. Right. Um, because you test negative and your roommate got COVID doesn't mean you're negative again two days. Right. It's just for that moment in time that you're tested. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you still should quarantine yourself. And, you know, he's doing the whole mask and Lysol and cleaning everything around him to, to reduce the possibility of being infected. Uh, but this is the... Uh, challenge we have. Our economy moves only as well as we are and our ability to keep ourselves healthy is the only way to keep ourselves alive as well yeah. as our economy moving. And the economy equals people. I mean, you know, you, you, it's not some it's not some foreign entity. It's it's people who do make it happen. Yeah. And I've been a repeating broken record about those who remember what records are. I think there's a whole generation of folks that watches don't know what records are. It's probably but, <laughs> yeah. You know, sound like a skipping record. Uh you know, I mean, again, wear your mask, you know, wear, you know, hygiene, sick, don't go to work, keep away from right. others, you have to go out, you know, reduce your exposure to other folks as much as possible. I, I just do not know. I mean, we've been saying this for literally almost, almost a year. Almost March 17th yeah. was the last time I was in for any kind of meeting that got canceled because of an infection in the state house. Mm -hmm. So it was the last time I was actually in there for, uh, for a meeting purpose. Right. Um, and uh, we evacuated the building once we found our infections occurred in the building. So, um, yeah, no, it's 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 kind of coming up on a year fast. This is uh, the point in the program where you tell us how to get a hold of you, Tacky. Yeah, give me a call, 617-722-2014, 617 Did I get it right? 722-2014. I know that uh, I've heard some issues regarding people are asking the phone system. Just hit any staff person and leave a message. We are getting our best messages via uh, email. So when you leave a voicemail, it goes becomes email and sent to the individual staff person, which we will, we will listen to. Uh, you obviously can check my Facebook, State Representative Tacky Chan. We, we continue to push uh, information up as we get it from the governor's office and CDC and PPH and others. Uh, we have uh, the tackychain.org website, uh, which also we use to as a resource center if people are looking for stuff that you may not need to call me at all. Uh, you can look there and see you can find the information you're looking for as well as my Facebook site uh, that connects to other links and, and so forth. And uh, you always can try to email me at tacky.chan at mahouse.gov, T-A-C-K-E-Y dot C-H-A-N at M-A-H-O-U-S-E dot G-O-V. Um, as I talked about earlier, you know, we so filing season's on, so yeah. we're in for the deluge of uh, email requests for uh, non-constituent-related issues. And people are wondering about constituent-related issues. We're talking about you got problems with DUA, you have problems with RMV, you're having a question about you know what service agencies you need to contact, um, you know that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. If you uh, email me on, uh, for example. Uh, Funding for higher education coming up in the budget. I will read that email. It'll, it'll be logged in. I'll save those emails. Okay. I'll read those emails. But again, the priority goes back to folks that have immediate questions and concerns. So if you're having problems uh, understanding a fraud issue uh, regarding, say, COVID vaccine fraud, 
you know, we're happy to try to help clarify that. And now tax season is coming around. There's tax fraud scams starting again. Um, and one more note about scams, you know, with the governor's proposal for a 75 and older, I, I do understand there's a lot of concern about getting the vaccine and getting there. I, I, I get it. But please do not take, have strangers take you to get um, vaccinated. Definitely go with somebody you trust that is your regular caregiver that you have regular contact with. Part of the reason why the accompanying idea is out there is that, for example, in my situation, I took my mom out to get the Pfizer vaccine at Tufts Medical Center. I am the primary caregiver. I am with her 99.9% .9 of the time. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that if the person you're living with, that your caregiver with is highly vulnerable, you, you will also want that person with that person safe. In my instance, because we talked about earlier, the whole scheduling thing doesn't make sense, and I have no idea how that's going to work. So I'm not getting vaccinated until I understand exactly what's going on. Right. I, we didn't use the web portal. Um, and I also got some, as we talked about, some health issues on my own that got to resolve regarding how the vaccine impacts me. Yes. Um, uh, but, I mean, if you're listening to this and you're very concerned about you know, that, please you know, go with someone that comes that you trust that will have regular contact with you. Great, right. great advice. Yeah, don't answer an ad online, or you know, if somebody comes to your door or solicits you by mail. You know, it, that that's going to be a problem. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm fearful of people like you know, you have to pay somebody to take them there, and so they can get vaccinated. Don't don't do that. Right. Don't do that. If you have a friend that you have regular contact with, if you have a, a family member you have regular contact with through the pandemic, we have regular engagement. With, please. You ask them to take you to get vaccinated and be the company person to vaccinate with. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Um, you know, as consumer chair, I'm very concerned about fraud and scam, very concerned about what people have been taking advantage of. And, um, and I, you know, people are scared right now. So that is my you know, best advice to people on, on the uh, who to bring as uh, the company in person uh, with uh, your uh, father or mother or grandfather, or grandmother or grand aunt or grand uncle or aunt and uncle, who, whoever the family member is. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is my strongest advice because it, the point is your caregiver is the ones we regularly contact in, in contact with you. The caregiver is vaccinated. You're vaccinated. Uh, it, it improves the chance your caretaker is going to be there for you when you need the caretaker. Correct. Yeah. Great advice. Jackie, good luck with your uh, roast duck. Yep, and let's, let's see the two o'clock how I how I make up in committee assignments. The Senate's at eleven o'clock, so they've already started their process. <laughs> That's really go first. <laughs> yeah, so we, we can we can talk about how our colleague John Keenan made out, as well as our entire delegation next Friday. Yeah, and I want to hear about your your roast duck recipe for the new year too. <laughs> I'll text you a picture. See. Well, if it looks good, I'll text you a picture. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, very happy, healthy New Year to you and 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 yours. Uh, and uh, let's hope for better times ahead. You too. Very, very. Wish everyone a happy start to the year of the ox. Mm -hmm.